Hi, my name is Gary Falter with the Jockey Club. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's online panel. Now, today's panel is going to give you important insight on how pedigrees and confirmation play out when you're selecting your thoroughbred racehorses. And now as the panel progresses, if you have questions for the panelists, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And at the end of the panel, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as time allows. The Owner Conference Series is hosted by the Jockey Club and the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association. I'd also like to recognize our sponsors, starting with the presenting sponsors, Bessemer Trust, Dean Dorton Equine, and Stoll Keenan Ogden. I'd also like to thank today's panel sponsor, which is Ocala Breeder Sales. Our sincere thanks to all the sponsors for their continued support of thoroughbred ownership. We hope you enjoyed today's panel and return next month when we have a panel of veterinarians covering a variety of equine health topics. Today's moderator is racing analyst, Kate Bradar. Thank you, Kate, for being with us today and please take it from here. Thank you, Gary. And thanks to all who are joining us today. I wanna to welcome everybody to the 2022 Virtual Thoroughbred Owner Conference Series. And as Gary mentioned, I am Kate and Bradar from TVG. I'm so excited about this panel because I feel that this is an area where every one of us can um, start learning a little bit more about what goes into the racehorse in terms of his ability, his or her ability to actually succeed, to compete on the racetrack. And it's an area that I think everyone can learn all the time and improve on in terms of uh, reading pedigrees, in terms of confirmation, in terms of assessing horses. And we have a great panel. This is the second panel in a series um, that's taking place this year. And our schedule is a little bit different than previous years. So you wanna be sure to check out ownerview.com each month for the, the lineup and the schedule. Um, as our panel progresses, we'll spend about 50 minutes with some Q&A at the end. You'll see that Q&A feature at the bottom. Um, be sure to send as many questions as you want. We will wait until the very end to get to the questions and we will try to get to as many as we possibly can. Now again, pedigrees and confirmation is the topic and I wanna introduce uh, our panelists. We have a, just a great lineup today. Phil Hager with Taproot Bloodstock. Uh, Chad Schumer, founder of Schumer Bloodstock Agency, and Gail Van Leer, also the founder of Gail Van Leer Thoroughbred Services. Todd Wojciechowski is the director of sales at OBS, Ocala Breeder Sales, and uh, you are going to get a lot of great information today, so we're going to jump right in. If you see me kind of drifting off as far as my focus of attention, it's just to refer to the notes to make sure that we can cover all the bases because we've got some great slides as well uh, to take a look at that I think will give you some great perspective. But we'll dive right into pedigrees. And when the term pedigrees comes up in the industry, many people think we're talking about only the sire and the dam and they look most immediately. But as individuals who research pedigrees, um, I'm gonna ask everybody to talk a little about the influence of grandsires in the pedigree and beyond. And we'll start with Gail and Chad, either one of you wanna dive in. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll step up here um, to get the ball rolling. So uh, pedigrees are, of course, really important because they tell the history of what's happened in that family. And in racehorses, we're trying to repeat the good part of the history and eliminate the bad part of the history. So we start with who the sire is, and you can check that against any of the current sire lists. Um, and then the dam, you have to do a little more looking into because each mare is only going to have a few foals in her lifetime in comparison to how many foals a stallion will put out there. So one of the first things that I look at when I look at a pedigree is who is the dam, the mother, by? And I like to see sires that have been leading broodmare sires or leading sires as the sire of the mother. That's really where I start. And if that repeats itself in the second and the third dam, that's really a bonus for me because then at least I know 50% of the pedigree has continued with top quality horses. Um, and then from there, you have to look into what each individual female in that family has produced so far and sort of take it from there in your refinement. And I'll let Chad jump in. And Chad, do you, do you follow the same kind of guidelines or format or way of starting? I do. I think um, when you're looking at these pedigrees, it's important when you're looking at the dam to make sure if she's had runners 
she's had winners, two runners. So in other words, if she's had five foals, four to race, four winners, that gives you some confidence in buying the progeny of the mare. As Gail said, <clears throat> excuse me, we're looking at the, the, the past, what's happened in the pedigree, but we're trying to extrapolate what's gonna happen in the future. And I think it's important to know that the mayor has produced winners, the family has uh, regularly produced winners and hopefully stakes horses. I'm gonna keep you two on the hot seat a little bit. We're gonna talk about some different styles of pedigrees and a tool that you can use to, to start diving into those uh, bloodlines, those families. Let's talk about the use of five generation pedigrees and a catalog style pedigree. And we're gonna show both on the screen. Um, what you see on the right is what you would see in, in the catalog at most sales. Gail, um, talk a little about you know, what you're specifically looking at. You, you mentioned that you look to the sire of the dam. So what would strike you about this? And of course on the left, um, we do see that unedited um, in-depth pedigree. And I should note that um, you can get a five generation pedigree free on equine line. So that, that can give you a little bit more information, actually a lot more information than what you might get in the catalog page alone. Right, so on the, the five generation catalog page, in a, on an actual catalog page for a sale, you're not gonna see that much information. So you may wanna go back and look a little further, but what's interesting about this pedigree, if you see the colored parts of the pedigree, those indicated where um, ancestors have been duplicated in the pedigree. And, um, we can get into the weeds a lot more looking at this part down here on the bottom um, where it's showing what the crosses are and how many times it, each thing is crossed in the pedigree. So that, that can give you some indication on how inbred the horse is. And we can get into a lot of different pedigree theories on how inbred your horse should be. And is that a positive thing or a negative thing? Um, so this part that this five generation pedigree isn't entirely useful to me. I may want to look and see what the, if you know, how much inbreeding there is and how many uh, nicks or crosses there are. But other than that, really the, the printed pedigree that shows the, all the different ancestors of the horse, what the mare has produced, uh, what she has done. And one of the things, the, the better the quality of the pedigree, the more horses will be in the first and second dam. So if you get a pedigree, a catalog pedigree that shows four dams on a page, that means there wasn't much information in the first two dams or the first three dams. And so they're, they're pulling up something just to fill the catalog page. So reading these pedigrees, it's a lot about what's not there versus what is there. Uh, and so you have to do a lot of reading through lines. In a sales situation, the catalog page is basically supposed to be an advertisement for the horse. They are edited. So a lot of the negative part can be edited out and they'll keep just the better parts on the page. So sometimes if you really wanna de delve into a pedigree, you can go ahead and order the unedited version and just get a feel for what actually was removed and how important or not important was it. Chad, how often do you find yourself looking, as Gail mentioned, for the things that aren't on the page? Well, I would completely agree with what, what Gail said. In terms of the five generation cross, I think it's really useful at a glance to look at that and say, okay, I see where the inbreeding is. I see how this, this pedigree is lining up it makes it a little easier to see how all the various grandsires in the lineup on the page. Uh, we, we're gonna talk about nicking, I'm sure later, but just when I look at this pedigree, the first thing that jumps out at me is that not this time is the Son of Giants Causeway, it's Stormcat out of a Candy Ride mare. That Candy Ride Stormcat cross has been very, very successful and it's been duplicated here. Um, when you look at the right side of it, as Gail mentioned, it's a catalog page. They're, they're gonna edit that page to make the, the horse look as attractive as possible. Now, when you look at this page, you see that the first dam is a stakes winner. You see what the second dam has produced in terms of stakes, stakes production, graded stakes production as the case may be. When you're looking at a, a, a five cross pedigree, it doesn't show you anything from the female side. So that's why the, the catalog style page is very, very important in terms of determining if this family has been successful in producing good racehorses. 
Okay, now I'm going to get uh, Phil and Todd involved as uh, we talk about those edited and unedited versions of the, the catalog page. And you can purchase either on Equine Line. Um, Phil, take me a little deeper into the weeds with this. Um, what the differences, the things that strike you when you're, uh, say, looking at a catalog page and maybe going deeper into the unedited version? Sure. So I think uh, if I'm looking at buying a horse, I, I tend to kind of like to look at something that's unedited because the, you can look at every single horse in those first few generations, whereas an edited page is going to look a lot better because it, it really consolidates it to just the quality horses that you want to show on the page. So um, I kind of would say that if you're selling a horse, it's probably better to have an edited. If you're looking to buy one, it might be better for unedited. Um, I know when we were trying to push stallions or if we were trying to sell horses, it would oftentimes be better to edit it to look better than maybe it would look it with an unedited, unedited, so. Well, and Todd, as, as director of sales at OBS, um, this is where the editing kind of comes into play to start with. Um, can, can you tell us a little more too about kind of the philosophy behind the editing process and, and what those who are joining us should know about that? Well, I, while I agree that it, it is in some uh, sense an advertisement for the horse that's selling, um, the simple fact that you couldn't produce, you couldn't uh, publish unedited style pedigrees on every horse in the sale, or you'd have uh, you, the size of the catalog would be <laughs> dramatic. But, yeah, um, and I should, I want to just point out to, um, and Gary mentioned that to me, that the unedited that we see here, for example, is five pages long. So right. you you would have that yeah. for every horse right. in the sale. Um, and, and just so we're clear, the, the, the editing process is not to hide information or to keep information from a buyer. Um, Basically, uh, it is to summarize the pedigree, and, and and as you read through a catalog style pedigree, for example, if you look at uh, the first dam on Epicenter, um, you know it goes on and talks about the unnamed foals. It lists the unnamed foals down below, horses that haven't earned as much money as some of the other, as say uh, Epicenter himself. Um, whereas if you get into the uh, edited style, it'll tell you the number of foals that have had, the number of race horses that have ran, the number of winners, and then it'll list your black type winners. So the information is there. It's in a more condensed format. Um, again, I, I don't think it's there to, we're, we're not trying to hide it. Um, it's just to put it in a summary format. Uh, and quite honestly, the sales company itself doesn't edit those pedigrees. That's edited by the Jockey Club. Our, our uh, Pedigrees are produced by the jockey club that go in our catalog. Thank you. That That's a good uh, distinction. I didn't mean to suggest that you guys were the ones oh, that were doing yeah, it, but yeah. it, and it is, there's a, a lot to the process, um, but that it is pretty streamlined. Is that, that would be the case at every sale too, in every catalog page, correct? That the that's correct. Would... Every, every catalog page uh, that, that we have in our catalog comes from the jockey club. They provide us with that. While, while I have you here, we heard, I think Chad referenced nicking. Could, it, it's, could you give me kind of a, a definition of, of nicking that's kind of referring to a pedigree or potential mating? Well, for, for me, I think you probably have people on the panel that are, panel that are a little more in depth in pedigree, okay. studying pedigrees than I do. But I mean, as far as nicking for me, it's looking at a uh, similar type of crosses of of ancestors in a pedigree and to see what success has occurred uh, previously with those uh, ancestors uh, being bred together and uh, trying to look, as Gail said very correctly, trying to look into the future uh, and you wanna to try to duplicate the good stuff and maybe not duplicate the stuff that didn't work so well. Todd, do you wanna elaborate at all on, um, I'm mean, sorry, uh, Phil, uh, rather on uh, the idea of nicking? Sure. So um, most of the services look at sire line over sire line. So they're looking at, you know, the sire that's in the mating and then the, the sire of the dam or that that male line. So it could be like the grand sire or things like that. So um, you're looking at only a portion of the pedigree. So it I think it's a great tool because you can see what these crosses have produced based on how many times they've been attempted. 
Um, but they are a tool in that you still have to do your research on the female pedigree and what other, what else is being drawn from that side of it, which doesn't show in the, uh, the grade of the nick, basically. When, when you're dealing with nicking or utilizing nicking, how much is completely based on what's happened in the past and how much is speculative as to what you think will happen in the future with certain lines? So um, as far as looking at a grade of nicking or things like that, that would be based on the past. Um, and I might have certain ideas about maybe what might work based off of, you know, I'm not sure, you know, just the, the type of stallion that this might be or what races he might have won compared to what the mayor did and um, or what maybe that that female sire line is throwing. Um, but again, that would be kind of more speculation on what theories I may have that might work, um, whereas the nicking would only really show what historical data has has shown. We, we tackled the term uh, nicking a bit, and uh, there may be some more questions about that, but I want to throw out another term, um, inbreeding, which it sounds like something that you would want to avoid, but um, but there are a lot of success stories involving inbreeding. Um, so maybe this one for Chad, um, from your perspective, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable? Talk a little bit more about inbreeding. Well, I think we always have to have a bit of a generalization because there's no hard and fast rule to any of this. Um, personally, I like to see a three by four cross or a four by four cross in terms of inbreeding. And I like to see, uh, for example, if it's an inbreeding to a stallion, a, a son and a daughter versus two sons or even two daughters. That's just my personal preference. Everyone you know, would have their own approach. Uh, when, you're, when you're inbreeding to any particular horse, you're, you're hoping to emphasize their most positive qualities. Unfortunately, you can also emphasize their less, and less positive qualities, shall we say. So you do have to be careful with, with it. And I don't think you wanna to see too much inbreeding in any kind of a mating. I'm gonna switch gears completely a little and talk about um, kind of specifically what people are looking for and what you're focusing on. We talked a little about the pedigrees, but I'm wondering, um, and Gail, maybe you'll tackle this. When, when you're looking, are you looking for proven sires? Are you, do you, you know, look at dams of younger horses? What do you look for in the first or second dam, especially if you don't have that, that proven pedigree to go back to? Right, so I'm just gonna jump back, one comment back to the NICs. I think it's very important when you're doing these computer licks, NICs that you look at how many horses were actually conceived on that cross before you make really big decisions based on that. Statistically, we need large pools of data. And a lot of these crosses, uh, I know I get clients going, oh, I want to breed to this stallion. It's an A++ Nick. And then I look and there's 16 horses on the cross. So, but back to what you said. Um, okay, so if you have a, a, one of the things I don't like to buy is a mare by an unproven stallion that's unproven or so that's unraced, <laughs> that, that's like the triple negative. So, I, but people have budgets and sometimes you have to go outside of those things to try to fit something in. So um, there's always a lot of craze around the unproven stallions, but I, I keep a pretty strict rule. If I'm gonna buy an unproven stallion, it needs to be out of a mare that's already has a produce record. She's got to be proven that she can produce winners and hopefully stakes winners. So I think you have to be very, very careful getting caught up in the, the craziness that goes on with the unproven stallions. Bill, how about you? Yeah, I think Gail really touched on about everything I was gonna say um, because it all comes down to price. I think in a perfect world, you could buy a proven stallion, proven mayor, big family, Good confirmation but not everybody's budget will allow you to do that so um you know you see a lot of horses might run well and they're not by a good stallion and they brought you know twenty thousand at the sale but if you look them up a lot of times you know there was something about them maybe the the dam was throwing a lot of nice winners or there was a lot of back pedigree there um so it usually has to come from somewhere so does, does anyone on the panel have something they want to add about either nicking or inbreeding or even just philosophies regarding younger pedigrees? Well, I would just jump in to say that if you are going to buy an unproven stallion, 
maybe it would at least be on a, a cross that works successfully. So again, going back to epicenter, if you were gonna breed to a son of, for example, not this time, if it were out of a, a mare from the candy rod line, we know that that's worked. And so at least it gives you a little confidence to go forward. Um, we're gonna shift completely to, to confirmation, but I'm sure that there will be some questions about pedigree uh, that we will certainly go back to. But um, there are a lot of terms and attributes that are easily or quickly assessed, but um, we talk about back at the knees, we talk about offset, toes in and out. Those are just kind of a few of the words you'll hear thrown out there, but we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about them and, and what is and isn't um, acceptable. And we do have some slides. Now, not all things are gonna be as obvious as would be in this chart, for example. Um, it, I, I, this, is, this is my favorite chart though, because um, it's kind of just a collection of everything in the world that you could possibly see. And I don't know that we have too many, at least in the sales that we see that have all these traits, but you will see. Um, no, but I've owned a few. <laughs> I, yeah. I think I think Close. I read one, so just it was a long time ago, but <laughs> he definitely resembled that. Um, but if we go to slide two, um, Gail, we'll see something that is a little bit more indicative of correct confirmation. Um, talk a little about what what each of these represents here and, and what we're looking at. Okay, so um, maybe this is a good time to flash up my pictures real quick because one of the most important, things because of the, the way the stride travels with these horses is that their knees are critically important. So um, I usually start with when I'm talking to new people about confirmation is it's similar to architecture. If the two by fours in your house aren't installed correctly, the plaster is going to crack and eventually it could end up with, uh, you know, some major damage. So we need to have horses carrying their weight as, as structurally sound as possible. So I'm gonna just do a, well, let's see, the screen sharing is, oh, I see, we have to, hold on here. All right, so this is a horse that is breezing at full stride and you can see this horse right here, how much flexion there is in the ankle and you can see how back the knee flexes. All the weight is being carried on this one leg at, at this point in the stride. And the front legs take the most of this. So this horse is, is back considerably and has long pasterns too. So this is almost parallel to the ground. So if we go to this picture here, you still see there's a flex, but not as extreme as the other. And there's still a parallel here. Um, this horse is more of what you would normally see. And this horse is a stakes winner already. So um, I guess we can unshare the screen and go back to those drawings. So here's pretty much the black and white version of it where it shows the plumb line going through the knees on two different views as well as going through the hind leg and that's what you're looking for. Um, if we go to the next slide we'll see some some more of the faults that um, Gail alluded to and uh, I guess I'll ask Chad to jump in as well. You'll see um, kind of extremes in each of these instances, but they can be very subtle as well. They can be. And I think it really depends on who you're buying for. Uh, you know, everyone has a certain level of acceptance with, with faults and it's very difficult to buy a perfect horse as we all know. Um, I mean, the slides are great, but, but they're, they're not terribly realistic. Uh, certain trainers have, you know, inclinations that they won't buy a horse that toes in or they won't buy a horse that toes out. So. I think it really depends on who you're buying for. Um, more importantly than anything, I think you just have to look for an athlete, a horse that uses himself or herself well and, and, and has a, a good walk. Um, if a horse had all of these faults, obviously you wouldn't want it. But if, if a horse had one, maybe two faults, perhaps you could live with it based on budget. Are there any of these that are listed right here that are you know, just absolutes for you that you, you wouldn't consider? Well, that's hard to answer without seeing the actual horse. Um, so I'm going to say, if I had to pick one, I would say bow-legged would take me out. 
but the rest I could probably live with. Yeah. Um, if we move to the third slide, there are, or fourth slide, I believe, there are some other leg faults continuing. And um, Gail, anything here as well? I know you had mentioned um, back at the knee when we were looking at the, the picture, right. but um, toed in and toed out can be two very different, even though they involve the same flaw right. in reverse, it, yeah. they can affect the horse very differently. Right. I think it, uh, in to what Chad says, you have this big thing hanging over your head called your budget. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times there are going to be, you, you have to see the whole horse. Like if it's a very heavy bodied horse, then you have to be a lot more careful as to what confirmation flaws you'll accept. A lighter framed athletic horse, you're going to be able to train through a lot of those flaws. Um, my personal experience with back at the knee is uh, on a heavy horse is it's not what you want. You're going to end up with knee chips. So again, it de depends on how the, how athletic the individual horse is. And I need to see what their body weight is too. Physically. I, I steer away from top heavy horses, especially Colts, because I've spent enough time as a trainer uh, in the stall trying to keep those horses sound and, that's, that's one of my big no-goes. Um, you mentioned when we were looking at the pictures about the emphasis on the front end and how much pressure the front end takes um, in regards to confirmation and confirmation flaws in the course of the stride. Does that mean that the problems or issues in terms of confirmation up front would be more of a, a disqualifier than problems behind? Yes, absolutely. I'll, I'll take a lot more flaws behind than I will in the front. Um, as we take a look at the some more hind limb, the next slide shows that. Um, Chad, how about you? Do you have a, a more emphasis for one versus the other? Well, I think you, know, you obviously want as good a hind end as you can. That's where the engine is. That's where they're gonna start off uh, with, their, with their running. Um, I, I think, you know, again, it really depends on the overall horse. So it's very easy to pick apart one conformational fault. But as Gail said, if a horse is a very, very heavy horse and he's very back at the knee, that's not a great thing. Um, it, it, so you have to kind of weigh the whole picture versus just one particular section. Anyone have anything else on these, uh, this last slide that they wanted to comment on? I, I would agree with Chad wholeheartedly. For myself, from the sales company, we take a much broader picture, uh, a viewpoint of it, because we're uh, selling animals to a lot of different buyers. And there may be certain things that Gail doesn't like that Chad doesn't mind or vice versa. Yeah, so yeah, I can't absolutely. focus as a, as a uh, sales company, I can't zero in on specific confirmational uh, flaws, if you will, and say, oh, we can't have that because for every person you find that says, I can't stand a horse back at the knee, you're going to find somebody that says, ah, that don't bother me, as long as this, this, and this occurs. And, mm -hmm. and to, to Chad's point, uh, I think you have to look at the horse as, as a whole unit, and rather than it, draw a distinction, particularly for people just starting out, being able to identify or see a confirmational uh, flaw, or we're calling them flaws, but being able to see a particular uh, confirmational composition doesn't always mean it's bad. Uh, if you want to see uh, uh, the greatest collection of not the most correct horses in the world, just go to the winner's circle of every grade one race <laughs> in the United yeah. States. Yeah. Um, so uh, the, 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 these, uh, what we're calling flaws, doesn't mean a horse can't run um, and it doesn't always affect their ability. Uh, the other thing that I would point out it's one thing the way a horse stands, but it is unique also to get an opportunity, particularly for us, the two-year-old sales, to see those horses in motion. Because I personally have seen horses in our sale that I've seen standing or walking at the barn that I would go, Whew, that's, that's a little too much there. And then when you watch that horse on the racetrack or watch his video, um, it doesn't translate. And you're going, this is crazy. How does this not translate? Mm -hmm. uh, usually it does, but in certain cases it doesn't. Uh, so I think seeing the foot in flight or seeing that horse in a stride uh, is a, 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 an important uh, data point, not just seeing how they're standing in front of you. 
in a still picture. Let's go to the next slide. And Todd, on, on that note, I'm wondering too, if what the, what are the things that would disqualify a horse or are there any in terms of confirmation for, from a sale? I think the only thing, the point that I would say is if there's any confirmational point that is extreme, that would have an effect on, on whether a horse is, is, is in a sale or not. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you, you know, they can always be a, a little bit long in the pasterns or straight in the knee, not quite back at the knee, um, you know, a little cow hocked, not so bad. Mm -hmm. Those things in the overall picture doesn't spoil doesn't spoil the painting, um, particularly when you're looking at a big beautiful body. Um, so yeah. I think when you start getting into extreme, so for example in your picture there, the long weak pastern, mm -hmm. yeah that that's pretty extreme. That drawing is extreme, and when you see that, yeah I would be I I would be even as, as the sales company go, oh, you might want to try a different avenue here. <laughs> Gail, it looked like you had maybe something to add. Right, I wanted to add my comment that I made when we did our rehearsal is um, the first time I went to Australia and went to the yearling sales there, I was shocked by how back at me all the horses by Dame Hill, one of the most exciting horses and stallions that stood and was successful in two hemispheres. Horse after horse were back at the knee. It was very consistent. And yet he was hugely successful um, in Europe and in Australia, not so much in the US, um, but it just goes to show that some confirmation faults play out fine depending on where you're racing or the style of racing. So as Todd said, some of those horses that with the longer pasterns, well, they might be great horses somewhere else uh, rather than hard dirt tracks in the US or they might be okay. So I, I think you have to know where you're going with these horses when you buy them too. Well, we're hey, gonna show, show a, a image of what some have said was the perfect horse. He certainly was on the racetrack, um, but does he have perfect confirmation? Who am I going to, I'm going to knock Secretariat? Yes, yes, absolutely. Not, not me, no. I'm not going to knock Secretariat. So, so, so Phil, what do you have to, do you have anything to add? Phil, did, did, was, I'm, I'm curious too, um, was, I don't think we touched on you too much during the, the confirmation process. Is there anything else? And um, what I will ask though, what made, what were the things that strike you that are right when we look at Secretariat? So I, I will, I will, sorry, didn't mean to jump in, but I will tell you one thing that I, I had a, 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 a older horseman tell me one time that uh, a, a gentleman that I uh, learned a lot from and had a lot of faith in and admired as a horseman, just as a pure horseman, not as a thoroughbred or uh, any particular breed. He was just a true horseman. And he was familiar with both the quarter horse breed and the thoroughbred breed. And he was uh, big into measuring things before measurements and biomechanics really kind of people uh, started uh, putting data points together via computer. Um, and he told me one time that, uh, that he had the opportunity to measure, uh, it was either him or someone else. And I may be telling the story, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, Secretariat's hawks were lower to the ground than Dash for Cash, who was a champion sprinting quarter horse. And that, uh, that Secretariat's hawks were lower to the ground than Dash yeah. for Cash. And for those that hawks low to the ground uh, is, is, a, is a confirmational point that you like from a speed and power standpoint. And, and that is, it is interesting. And when you talk about the difference in confirmation in looking at quarter horses, uh, sometimes I'll say you use the terminology in the paddock and analyzing a horse in a sprint race that he, he looks very quarter horsey. Um, that that uh, what you mentioned uh, about uh, the hindquarters, but even carrying through, um, it sort of depends on what you're looking for in the horse too, right? As far as what confirmation, if you were thinking it was a pedigree that was geared toward a speed type horse, a top sprinter, then you might see more of that um, 
that type of a confirmation in the horse too. So they sort of go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah, and that's a good point. Uh, you know, going back to the pedigrees, and I'm sure Chad and Gail run into this all the time. You know, when, when you're looking at pedigrees or you're looking at confirmation, you kind of want things to match up. If you've mm -hmm. got a, uh, you know, a very turfy European style pedigree, and you've got a little 14-3 bulldog, something don't add up there, right. uh, and vice versa. If yeah. you're, you know, you're looking at a sprinter, and all of a sudden a 17 hand narrow two turn looking horse yeah. comes out like some so I, I think you need to try to square the two sure um chad i'm we're gonna switch gears a little bit and just talk about a vet and the vet's role in terms of um ranking horses and and it does come into play a little bit with especially with confirmation as well but um there's also things that vets will do with the horses throats exam throat exams x-rays all the kind of getting internally to try to get even more of a read on any potential sure. um, roadblocks or things. Um, and I, I understand that often they use a numeric system. I'm just wondering how much that comes into play and what you're doing, what you're looking for, how that works and how subjective they could be or how maybe they're not. I don't know if it, because you're dealing with veterinarians, is it, is it a little bit more objective? I think they're very subjective depending on the horse and, and there's so many factors to consider. I always go back to why am I buying this horse? Who am I buying this horse for? What is the purpose? And it, for example, we, we just did a pin hooking uh, partnership that sold some horses in Dubai and to qualify for the sale, the horse had to vet pretty much hundred percent before they would put it in the catalog. So when I was buying horses for that order, I had to be a little more, persnickety about what I could take in terms of a vet report and what I could live with versus when I'm buying to race. Sometimes you see little things on a vet report that they're just growth issues. They don't really matter. You might be looking at a yearling and this horse is going to be racing a year or two years later. It might be something you can live with or the horse might grow out of. But if you're buying for a specific purpose, panicking say to Europe or Dubai or certainly to the OBS sale, you have to be a little bit more unforgiving in, in, in the vet report because that horse is gonna be asked to do things early, earlier than it perhaps normally would. Is there anything that is kind of a, a wow factor for you or something that just jumps out to you in a positive way when you're looking at these horses? Well, I like to hear A plus throat. I mean, I like to, to know that the horse has yeah. a really good airway and the horse can yeah. breathe. So if I even get into when they start giving you the 2A or the, the, the lower grade or some sort of excuse for something, that's when I start to shy away. I, I think it's very important that a horse has a good airway. Gail, I heard you say, uh, affirm that. Is that the same for you? Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it's something you can't really fix. I mean, you can take out chips and you can allow a horse to grow to go through some of the growth related items like sesamoiditis, but you can't fix a throat. <laughs> yeah. right. um, Phil, are you back with us? I know we had some technical. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Sorry uh, about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, not at all. Do you want to jump in? Um, we're just if there's something in particular, as far as vets and and the reports and the information that you're getting back from that is either a wow factor for you or something that you're absolutely staying away from. Sure. So I mean, I think as touched on earlier, the throat is a big deal. I will say that I have bought good horses that were two A's. Um, but if it gets into a two AB, I, I kind of definitely shy away at that point. Um, but I think I live with a lot of that issues at, for racing, um, for pin hooking, you're trying to kind of keep up a, a perfect horse by the time you sell it. They also cost more though. So if it's a matter of taking a chip out of an ankle or things like that, you can get that horse at a discount. Um, whether you're buying a race or pin hook, I think those are good avenues to take if it's not, if it's an easy surgery or, you know, something that might resolve in time, um, mild sesamoiditis, you know, any of those things don't really, really affect my purchasing decisions, I'd say. We, um, we actually didn't really probably go into much depth about what you mentioned the 2A or A plus. Could you just um, reiterate what, or explain a little about what what those grades are, what that system is, what it ranges sure. from. 
Yeah, and so like some vets use different systems. I know Chad said an A plus. So some have different scoring systems, but a lot of them use um, basically a one A is a perfect throw, a big pretty throw that functions perfectly, right? Throat, but may just have slight asynchrony, um, and but you know performs well. And then once you start to get into a 2B, you have a lot more asynchrony. Uh, maybe the horse doesn't function as well. And then you, if you go down any further than that, it's kind of, you know, the throat's just not functioning well at all, or it's closed off, which means they aren't able to get as much air. And that, that's a big issue. Um, so. Todd, I think this is a good time um, to, when I was just, it occurred to me when I, we were talking about vets, how, things have changed as to what things are available for general um, perusal and vets taking x-rays and things like that. Could you just touch on that a little bit? Because I know in the sure. past, there are stories of people who horses um, don't get purchased in sales because of different confirmation faults that have gone on, but it's, it's a little different now than it was say 25 years ago or 20 years ago when you saw some very good horses coming out that maybe didn't even go through the sales because of confirmation issues. Well, I think no, there's no other point in time that there's been more, more data and more information available to a buyer. And a lot of stones get unturned, uh, get turned over versus what you, what you were talking about with horses in the past that, you know, there weren't as many data points along the way uh, to, to gather on these horses. So horses would fall through the cracks. Very few fall through the cracks anymore. Um, you know, we have a repository in place whereby the seller uh, can put x-rays uh, in the repository on that horse. They can put video scopes. Uh, the video scopes aren't quite as uh, well accepted as radiographs um, in the repository currently. Typically, a buyer would like their own vet to look at it. And, and the throat is a very dynamic thing. Um, it's, it's amazing. And I've seen it here. I've seen it over and over again. You can have a horse that doesn't scope so great one day and the next day when he's rested scopes fine. Um, so it, it's very dynamic. Um, and it, it, when you're scoping a horse or you're looking at a set of x-rays, you're looking at a moment, you know, moment in time. You're not looking that horse over a, a long period of time. But to your point, there's a lot more information available to the buyers now. I, I'm gonna kind of go around the horn and just ask if, um... First, if, if pedigree or confirmation one is more important than the other for anyone, it kind of sounded like everybody was in agreement that they sort of went hand in hand. Um, and then also at the same time, if there are any, any particular things that we haven't touched on in this conversation about the role of vets or the, the systems that you're using when you're selecting horses, Gail, we can start with you. Um, yes, they definitely go hand in hand, and the budget is part of the of the, of the other hand. So, um, I guess for me, I'll if I have a tight budget, I'm going to tend a little bit more towards the individual, but I still want some pedigree. Dad, how about you? I think it starts with pedigree for sure. I mean, the pedigree to me is the most important thing, but. If a horse has a terrible physical, you know, the pedigree wouldn't matter as much. So it does go hand in hand. As Gail mentioned, we, we all have to live with a budget. That's the number one thing. Even if it's a big budget, you still have to, there's always going to be someone that's going to spend more than what your budget is uh, for the most part. So I, I think that's where you have to start and, and you have to decide what you can live with and what you can't live with and what's most important to you. And Phil? Yes, I agree. I think it's a it's a balance. I'd probably say I'd lean sixty to seventy percent on physical and and then thirty to forty on pedigree. But it might depend on what you're looking for. If you if you want a future broodmare, you probably need to be careful about what kind of pedigree you buy. And um, you know, same thing if you're trying to buy a horse that might become a stallion. You know, you have to have enough pedigree to do it, um, and they have to perform. But um, but again, yeah, it's, it's both of them are important. And, and Phil, while we have you here, we're gonna transition to other tools that um, can help you at the sale. Um, one in particular we have, and we do have some slides to demonstrate it is the catalog app, but are there any particular tools that you use? Do you use this catalog app? Yes, I use it, uh, probably transitioned maybe two years ago. Um, 
and it's been a complete game changer just from amount of time you save. Um, all the research is already done for you. So updates, posts, live, um, you have your breeders, you have your sales history. Um, you can make notes, you can make short lists, you can send out short lists, pictures to clients. Um, so it's just, it's a one-stop shop and it saves a ton of time for, for what we do. Gail, are you also uh, util utilizing the catalog app? Uh, absolutely. I've been on it since like the second year it came out. Uh, it, you know, cause I've always loved technology and I, I'll still go back to laughing at the first sale I tried to use it at. I picked a sale with only 150 horses and the consigners gave me all kinds of grief. She's back again with the iPad. But, you know, once you get past that learning curve, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. And, and from my perspective, it saves me having to have staff. I can do kind of the work of a person and a half by having the iPad. Chad, what are we looking at here in, in terms of the catalog app? Well, I, I also use the app and, and thanks to Gail, I'm, I'm getting better at it. But um, <laughs> uh, what we're looking at right here is a, is a search tool. And it's if you're looking for a particular you know, sire line, if you're looking for uh, a particular, if you're buying mares, for example, it says choose covering sire. So you can look through all the mares and fall to a certain horse at one, one click and it lines them all up for you rather than turning page by page by page to try to find them. And I think we have, yeah, a couple more left slides from the catalog app. Um, talk, talk a little while we see shortlist, what that means. Um, okay, so the first thing I do is go in there and rename all those and move them all around and I use them and not, I've used them for various things. Like I always put the top one becomes the horses that I bought. And then I go through and I select short lists and I make those for the ones I want to look at, the ones I want to keep on the list. And then I put names on them by the individual buyers I'm looking for. If I find horses with pedigrees that are related to something else I bought that a client still owns, I'll single those off to the side. So those short lists I use for just keeping myself organized. It sounds like you should be giving us all a tutorial on how to use it. <laughs> you know, the, the one great thing it does is it does let you keep all of your information in one spot. Yeah. Because not yeah. only the, just the things that Gail and everyone else has enumerated, uh, you'll be able to see their breeze vi in our sale, the two-year-old yeah. sales, You'll be able to see their breeze video, their walking video, you'll get their breeze time. And all of that information is going to be right there on that specific horse. Right. And, yeah, and to follow. Oh, sorry. You can yeah, go ahead, well, Gil. you can take your own pictures, too. So if you have a picture other than and it keeps all the pictures together instead of there with your cell phone going like this, right. trying to find the picture that you want. And Phil, it, you could go with what you said, but it, it's all you can customize throughout the entire through the app, just about every aspect of it, right? For sure. Yeah. So uh, first of all, just to finish up what they were saying, I think that one of the really cool things also is that you can archive your whole collection of sales books. So, you know, I used to have like a bookshelf of sales Me books, too. you know, go back and find the hip number, you know, and yeah. this is what I wrote about this horse. Or, uh -huh. So it's good from an educational perspective of you see a stakes winner pop up and you can see what you wrote on that horse. It's also good for if you're ever claiming, you know, a filly and you have notes on her. Um, yeah. So all those types of things are helpful. Um, and then as far as customizing it, you can have, yes, yeah, so you can have like your different grading scale, you can have different confirmational notes. I have one that's, you know, about the head and the neck. I have one that's about the feet. I have yeah. uh, even like kind of weird things that I might look for the, that I, I have noticed in good horses in the past, you know, and um, so you can customize it however you want, really. Todd, the, this technology for the catalog, but across the board, I'd say technology has really been a game changer for, for the sales the auction world hasn't it oh absolutely um you know i just mentioned the video and the walking videos those are you know a lot and, and you know one bright spot of the covid pan the pandemic it has brought a lot of technology to light that we wouldn't have used prior yeah. to the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, specifically for us online bidding was non-existent uh prior to the pandemic and now uh, there's not a sales company out there that doesn't 
uh, offer online bidding. Um, and just the, the, like I said, the videos, the quality of the videos uh, that you can put on a small device, the quality of the walking videos that can be produced. Um, there's just never been more, uh, uh, more data available to a buyer. Okay, this is a question for everybody as we look at the last slide, which is, this is the auction edge, the blood horse auction edge. And I am not as familiar with utilizing that, not having um, done the sales in quite some time. So anybody wanna jump in and explain what it is? Well, for me, it's, I, I couldn't live without it. I, I buy a lot of brood mares at the sales and when you can quickly look at all their previous folds and their purchase price, not just their purchase price, but who bought them, whose hands they're in, where they've raced. You've got the equibase number, the thoroughgraph number. It's comprehensive information on their progeny and all the information you need right there in front of you. And in the case of this two-year-old that you're using as an example, it doesn't just show the current stud fee for Constitution, it shows the production stud fee. So when you lead into the budget part of this, that's a big factor. Someone might think to themselves, well, I can't afford a constitution. His, his stud fee is 85,000, but this particular individual was produced when it was 15,000. So that might make the horse fit into your budget. Right. Um, I'll add one more tool to that. We have the, the broodmare produce records, which is also available on the iPad. I'm in that constantly. So that provides a lot of the same information that the buyer's guide provides. It does, and it's updated daily, which yeah. is also very, very important. Yeah. Well, we've got one last question before we are gonna go to our uh, guests' questions um, and our attendees, but um, this last one will be kind of fun, I think. Um, can, and this is for everybody, if you can think of a horse that had some unsatisfactory confirmation traits or and or a modest pedigree that ended up as say a graded stakes winner. So someone who um, we mentioned, we see a lot of them in the winner circle. I, the one that comes to mind for me in personal experience was Skip Away. Um, I yes. remember that. An OBS um, graduate. Yeah. <laughs> having, Naturally. Having followed his career um, throughout and uh, remember that uh, what could not be bought out of the sale. <laughs> but uh, so and, the, yeah. the, the story of that horse uh, for, for the people that are listening, that horse uh, had an ankle chip um, and uh, was going to be returned. The people didn't want it. So they said they'd, they'd keep it and they didn't bother to take the ankle chip out. Uh, there was no surgery. They just left it in. And that horse went on his way to, uh, you know, a tremendous career. Yeah. Champion and a champion older horse and- uh, Breeders' Cup Classic. All he did was win. <laughs> all he did was win. Yeah. Season after season with the ankle chip. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anybody else? Mine is California Chrome. <laughs> that, that, that horse, he, he checked all the boxes of why he shouldn't have been a good horse. He, he was very crooked. He uh, had no pedigree, but yet there was something there. I mean, he had a beautiful balance if you looked at, at him from the side, but uh, he, he definitely broke all the rules. Um, I'm trying to think. So when, when I was on the track, I worked for Bill Mott and we had flat out. So flat out was a really pretty horse, but just had awful feet and uh, had to work daily on the feet and everything. But, you know, I guess with the right management and everything, horses can overcome faults and um, realize, you know, what they were meant to do. And um, just another cool one, I thought, from a pedigree perspective was uh, get Stormy, who just passed away, but we stood him at Crestwood and he, he really doesn't have a whole lot of pedigree from a female perspective, but he has a lot of really cool inbreeding going on. So it's an example of maybe even though the pedigree is not showing that it, there's runners coming out of it, it worked with the mating, you know. Um, so or at least that's why he was who he was, you know. I often think about Real Quiet. There's a horse, was a very inexpensive yearling. Uh, was a very good two-year-old, grade one, grade one two-year-old, but came back not only to win the Kentucky Derby, but almost won the Triple Crown. And at the time, he, I think he brought 11 or 17,000. It was a very small price. And uh, just goes to show you what, what options you have out there, so. In, in real recent, I can point to a, a graduate of ours from our March sale last year, Wyda Barrio, just won the mm -hmm. Florida Derby. Yeah. It's a $40,000 yeah. purchase in March. 
yeah. um, just kind of got looked overlooked, um, but certainly does his job pretty well. Absolutely. Definitely. I, I think it was um, definitely apt when, when we mentioned at the beginning that um, the winter circles are filled with those horses that sort of defy the, what, what we think of in terms of either pedigree or, or purchase price or confirmation. So um, it is definitely not an exact science. Right. The one thing that I would say to the people listening is uh, we've talked about a lot of tools and, and I kept saying that at no other point in time is there more data available on horses. Just be careful of paralysis by analysis. Yes. Ultimately, you got to make a decision. Yeah. And don't get into the weeds too much on yeah. all of these little nitpicky things. Mm -hmm. If you see something you like, try to identify what you like and, and buy it. Yeah. I think looking at brood mares at you know good brood brood mares that were good race horses, um, looking at them at sales is a good education too. Absolutely, absolutely right. One thing we didn't touch on: it's not an important tool and it's not a definitive tool, if you will. But that's gut instinct. Sometimes when you're at a sale, you, you yeah. just see a horse and you have a reaction to it, and and that is a good thing. And and as in life, it, sometimes it makes sense just to follow your gut instinct. I think that is an excellent point and um, some some terrific information, truly. Um, at the end of the day, I think that uh, going with your gut is usually the best, whether you're at the races handicapping or watching them, just getting a feeling about uh, things usually pans out pretty well. I We are going to move into the question and answer period after concluding our panel discussion, but um, we're going to sort through the questions. Nobody go anywhere. Please enjoy the following from Blood Horse our Q&A sponsor, and then we'll get back with the question and answers. Blood Horse Plus, available through bloodhorse.com, provides exclusive, timely, and unmatched content to subscribers, including Fox Sports, Blood Horse branded weekly programs, a detailed stakes winners section, behind the scenes videos from Blood Horse staff, on demand access to deeper horse statistics, and a $5 monthly credit to equineline.com. Upgrade to Blood Horse Plus today. All right, we're going to start with the questions from the audience. We have several questions here, so let's get to them right away. And uh, I, I'll direct some of these to individuals, and then uh, anybody wants to chime in, uh, uh, please do. So can you please comment from a confirmation point of view on paddling or winging at the walk? Dale? Dale? <laughs> um, okay, so again, I'm going to go back to my, my uh, confirmation is similar to architecture. So if a horse paddles or wings, it's because their legs aren't square in the architecture. And depending on the individual horse itself, and depending on the severity of that, they may interfere or they're going to put extra stress on their ligaments and their ankles, the suspensory ligaments in particular. So it, again, we have to go back to, well, is this a heavy horse? Is this a light framed horse? Is this a horse that um, can glide through his stride because they're athletic? So you have to weigh everything to know if you can live with the amount of paddling or towing in that they have. Okay, anybody else? Okay. The one thing I, I would jump in, Gary, uh, the one thing that we're talking about confirmational points, um, and I see, I see it frequently as we look at, you know, all of us look at a lot of horses over a year. Um, and sometimes you can have counteracting faults. So, um, you know, where a horse is offset and that would create usually kind of a paddling motion or a, uh, a, a motion where the weight is outside of the column of the two front legs. Um, sometimes when you see that coupled with say back at the knee, uh, it changes how that gait, uh, how the, the motion of that leg in the air and allows that uh, knee an opportunity to kind of get back underneath the animal. Mm -hmm. So all of those things kind of tie in together. I think it's hard to pick out one specific confirmational point uh, and say whether that is good or bad. It, it's really how it relates to the rest of the horse. I would agree. Okay. Here's a question. Uh, well, based on my budget, I can't have both, but what's more important, a good sire or a good mare? 
and pedigree. Good I'd mayor. say, yeah, good mayor. <laughs> okay. Uh, confirmation, toe in or toe out in the front, which can be more of an issue. Well, I think it depends on where you're racing. I mean, um, you know, if you have a horse, if I'm buying for Europe, I might buy a horse that, that toes out on the left, whereas in America, I wouldn't want that because they're going to lead with that leg. So it depends on where it's going and, and the purpose. But if I had to pick, I'd probably rather have towing out. Okay. Uh, how does one assess the horse's mind? Does pedigree lend itself to how a horse develops both mentally and physically? Uh, I'll answer that because I, I just had another lecture from a trainer that said, don't buy me any more Pioneer of the Niles. I really <laughs> said you won't have to. But, but yes, um, there's certain sire lines that uh, they're known traits of, of their, you know, they're just more difficult to handle. Taffet is one of them. Stormcat was one of them. Um, mm -hmm. But we know these horses can run and have ability. So people are willing to go along with that, the program. But um, yeah, you, if that's about at a sale, you have a very little time to judge the minds of these horses. You have to pick up how they're acting on the track, how they're acting at the barn. If you know the people in the, that are the consigners or like for us that go to from sale to sale, the staff goes from sale to sale. And we know a lot of the people that show the horses to us and, and handle them. And so sometimes we can get insights from them. But even them, or they, they've only seen these horses for the last day and a half. So you can only gather a little bit of information. Well, along those I same would, lines, I would Gail. add to that. I would Go add ahead. to that, Gary, too, that you, in the pedigree, you may be able to glean some information that if you see the progeny of a mare, they're all starting at two. Um, that would lead you to believe that those horses uh, tend to come to hand early and, uh, uh, you know, don't usually have any hiccups in the early training process versus uh, a mare that everything of hers starts at four. Um, so I think you can glean some of that information from the pedigree as well. Okay, good point. Um, so here's a question. What is the name of the sales catalog app? And I can answer that. It's Equine Line Sales Catalog App. And you'll find it out on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, app store and it's free. There's no cost to it. So. Uh, you have any questions about that? Uh, just give one of our uh, uh, staff at the equine line a call, and they can answer any of your questions about that app. Um, here's one: What does dosage mean? Anybody want to jump into dosage? <laughs> dosage is a rating system based on, uh, I believe, uh, Dr. Roman uh, created it. I might be wrong about that, but it is uh, a numerical uh, equation, if you will, that assigns numbers to different stallions in different categories. So it ranges from brilliant, uh, speedier types to intermediate to uh, stamina laden types. And it, it comes up with a number that in terms of the Derby anyway, it was supposed to be, I think 4.0 or under was, was a horse that would have more of an aptitude for the distance. Okay. So you talked about nicking. Um, can you talk about the difference between true nicks and enics? Anybody use those products? Um, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at that and you can probably correct me, Gary. My understanding is TrueNix uses the entire Jockey Club database. So every horse in that database, whereas Enix, the horses have been manually entered over time. I don't know if that's still true, but that was my understanding originally. Uh, I know the first part of what you said is true. I, I can't really reference Enix myself. Right. Okay. Um, inbreeding. Is three by three inbreeding too close? I think it depends on the Is horse. Is he a graded I mean... stakes winner? Then no. <laughs> 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 That's it. I mean, I think it depends on the horse. And um, some horses you might not want to do a lot of inbreeding to, and especially not up close. Um, you know, I don't know, just like an example we used earlier, maybe a storm cut up close like that might be offset knees and hot temperament, you know, or yeah. things like that. So I think, um, I don't know that I would really recommend it, but I guess if I like the rest of the mating um, and there happened to be a three by three I wasn't worried about, then I'd be okay. But Okay. 
um, how important is the neck in the balance of a horse and why? I would say it's extremely important um, because it's kind of a balancing point for the, it's almost, if you remember the old, uh, the little bird that dipped his uh, beak into the water and would continue. So um, I, I think of it as uh, most of the horse's weight is carried on its front end rather than its hind end. So it, the longer that neck, it allows uh, kind of a balance of that weight, if you will. Mm -hmm. A little short necked horse is going to tend to be choppier strided, yeah, kind of like a... uh, shorter, choppier strided. A uh, longer neck horse seems to give you a more fluid, longer stride. I'd agree. And given that we're yeah. not changing directions, we're going in straight lines. We want longer fluid. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, here's a question for Gail. Could Gail explain what she meant by the craziness of the unproven or freshman sire and what would be the pros and cons of selecting them for your mare? Okay, so. You're uh, with a freshman sire, it's unproven. Thus, it's not a proven failure yet versus stallions that are already uh, proven as a quality stakes producer or kind of in that gray area. So when I say the craziness, there's some logic behind that people spend huge amounts of money on unproven horses because they're chasing a dream. And sometimes the things that they do are not logical um, for the amounts of money spent on a particular pedigree. So that, that's pretty much my emphasis there is you just have to like calm down and really look at what you're doing here. And if you're, I, I advise my people that are buying to race to wait for the second or the third year and see how they sell, see how they look at the two-year-old sales and then maybe consider buying one. You'll get a much better price on them if you don't buy them in the first year or the second year. But if you're buying to pin hook, then you want to have that hot commodity on the market why it's hot and hasn't been damaged yet. So that, that's what I was trying to emphasize. Okay, a couple more questions. Uh, can the panelists rank or order the relative value of the success of the dam or Nick's crosses line breeding? So rank the order of the, and the value of the success of those four items, the dam success, Nick's crosses and line breeding. Uh, I think for me, the number one thing is going to be the dam success. Um, okay. I go back, yeah, I go back to what I said about the the Knicks. You've got to be very careful on how many crosses, how many foals are actually created on that Nick. Um, numbers you rarely see more than fifty or eighty, and every I came across one the other day that had a thousand and seventy two and I thought wow that's the, okay I'll believe that one so I think you have to you know to me it goes back to the dam I think also further to what Gail said you have to pay attention to the not just the rating but the actual the whole pedigree as many times uh, you'll get an a plus rating say in a nicking that doesn't take in, into account the rest of the pedigree for example if, if game winner is a freshman sire and he is a, a candy rod out of an Indi Indian Charlie mare, and you put an Indian Charlie mare to, to game winner, it's going to give him an A plus rating because that cross has worked, not taking into account he himself is out of an, a, uh, an, an Indian Charlie mare. So I think it's very important that you look at the whole picture, not just one aspect. Okay, and we'll wrap up. Here's a question about the five cross pedigree. And I'll, I'll try to answer this also, and you guys can chime in if you'd like. How do you find on equine line a five cross pedigree for an unnamed colt or filly? And it's easy to do in that five cross pedigree section. You just put in the year of birth and the name of the dam, and it will generate the five cross pedigree. And you can do those on hypotheticals or horses that have already been born and, and registered. And does the jockey club make available a freely accessible public database of thoroughbred genealogy? And the answer is yes, the free five cross pedigrees. You can research uh, those pedigrees uh, as much as you'd like. Um, there's no uh, limit to how many pedigrees you can run. And we've got an awful lot of people that enjoy research and pedigree use that service. So those are available to you for free on equine line. So um, just have a couple of things I'd like to cover before we wrap up. 
Mayor Caton, we still are planning to do an in-person uh, thoroughbred owner conference in Saratoga. So if you have an interest in uh, learning about that or registering, just go to ownerview.com and we have all the information there. Also, our friends from Toba are going to have a ownership seminar at Churchill Downs on May the 4th, so just before the Derby. And attendees are going to learn insights on different aspects of ownership from the different, different professionals. And your meals and materials and access of racing in the after, afternoon, Toba gift bag are all included. So if you're interested during Derby Week uh, to learn more about ownership, go to the Toba website and you can register. So I'm going to drop off here, Kate, and if you can just wrap things up, just like to thank all of our panelists and our guests. And I hope to see you all next month when we have our veterinarians on a panel. Well, uh, thank you, Gary, and, and to, thanks to Shannon as well and uh, the Jockey Club for, for actually putting all this together. And I have to say that um, I learn something every time I moderate these, but this one I learned an awful lot. And I really appreciate the time that the panelists give. Uh, this is not an easy time of year, I know, especially for those who are involved in, uh, in your line of work. So thank you so much to our panelists for your time, your insight. Um, we wanna thank our sponsor, Ocala Breeder Sales. Uh, most of all, though, we do wanna thank the owners. Without the investment in racehorses, we would not have an industry. So many thanks to the owners that keep this game going. Uh, we appreciate the time everybody took to be with us today. Uh, those who asked some great questions, I hope we'll be back next month with our panel of distinguished veterinarians. Um, you don't want to miss that one. I know that's another one where we're going to learn an awful lot. But until then, I hope everyone has great success at the sales, at the track, or wherever you are, and that you all stay safe and enjoy uh, the rest of the lead up to the Kentucky Derby and to spring. Hopefully it is getting to you wherever you are. We're still, still working on it here in Kentucky, but uh, many thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.